All right. Well, welcome back. We're glad to have you join us. Um, so last week we kind of opened up the discussion uh, about you know our why behind uh, science and and uh, scripture, and you'll see just a few little thoughts that I had from last last week. You know, one of the comments was that nobody, no one is objective. We all um, have our own lens that we look at the the data and we look at scripture. Um, and you know, when reading scripture, it's important that we ask sort of the question: how How does the author want to be understood? Um, uh, Timothy Keller talked a little bit about that in the excerpt that we that we read. Um, so keeping that in mind, it was also made sort of the comment, you know, uh, sort of the absolute. I don't believe in God. I believe in evolution. Uh, I think it's important that we when we you know hear that we define what do you mean by evolution? You know, it's one thing to kind of describe it as a as a process, um, but it can't answer sort of the moral, the moral questions. And so when, when it's just a process, it's not necessarily, um, uh, in, in contrast or, or against, um, our understanding of scripture, depending on, depending on how, how you read scripture, um, and which we got into a little bit of defining science and faith and our why, um, and you'll see too, I think I gave, you'll find it, it I didn't give it to you. It's on that. It's on that uh, little uh, tables. I just kind of compiled all of our whys. So why we read scripture? What does it do for our faith? So you'll see just kind of a a whole bunch of uh, descriptions there um, of of how we defined our our why. I will say, as I read through this, though, it's kind of a consistent you know message of. We uh, we read it for our our guidance and in, in life to find wisdom and encouragement and uh, and our faith to follow Jesus. So how we read Scripture will have an effect on how we approach topics outside of Scripture, and the same could be said for science. Uh, what's the why of science? How we will answer that will inform how we approach topics of faith. When it comes to topics of faith in relation to the world. There can be lots of unnecessary anxiety that comes with it because it's a big it's a big topic. You know, it's kind of like, where do you even start? So with that, let's put away our worries and uh, focus on a better perspective. So you'll find on your um, handout, if you brought it, Does anybody need another one? Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you worth so much more than they are? Who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God much more do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what will we wear? Gentiles long for all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has trouble of its own. Let's pray. Lord, if we're honest, it's easy for us to get caught up in the things that we shouldn't worry about. And sometimes it's just as easy to get caught up in who is right instead of living into the goodness of who we are because of you. We praise you for creating us in your image and entrusting us with stewardship of all that you have made. Let us work with you to extend your creativity in the world for the benefit of all. Let us rest in you to grow even more confident in your goodness and to celebrate that goodness growing through all creation. Amen. So we're going to spend just a few moments, uh, maybe five minutes, find somebody that you didn't come with 
and reflect on the homework video from last week. And if you didn't get to watch it, try to find somebody who did. Um, you know, one of the last things that was mentioned in the video, and, and little, you know, a little brief on it is that it is a movement by the concepts of Rabbi, I should say the name, um, Shits Mordecai, the plan. That was a movement. Uh, 1881 to 1983, the views of, or that views Judaism as progressively evolving civilization rather than just a religion. Okay. Oh. Interesting. So, um, you know, there are all kinds of things they uh, disagreed on, but, you know, the last thing, that each if you've seen these videos before, they have these statements and you come forward and you talk about why you feel that way. Um, most of the time it's very respectful, uh, which I think we could learn a lot about. Um, but the last statement was, it's important to question one's own belief. And they all came forward in that moment. You know, they had, they were sure about some things, but I think one of them even mentioned, you know, don't work with people who are so sure of themselves that, you know, um, can't, can't kind of live into the mystery of, hey, there's, there, we're constantly, well, constantly the, discovering. The chemist, when they were talking about their paper, says, and this was the chemist says, a lot we cannot explain, or there's a lot that, that we cannot explain that has nothing to do with my faith. Yeah. And that, I mean, and it goes hand in hand. Yeah, there's lots of things yet to be discovered and fathomed. All right, so what I want to do now is I want you to look at this little contradictions area. Um, and I want you to make a list. You can do it in pairs. Make a list of things people have different interpretations on when it comes to faith and science, for example, dinosaurs. Go. Okay. So hopefully you won't find it surprising that um, there are diverse views on faith and science within Christianity. Uh, just as we interpret uh, scripture differently, we interpret uh, what the scripture has to say about the world around us. Now, when it comes to that, that why we read scripture, I noticed some some themes about that, but how it plays out is all over the place. So we're going to take some time, and you'll notice on your handout on the next page, um, some places to fill in the blanks. So as I go along, um, just fill them in. And if you don't get them, I'm glad to answer them later on. But let's take some time uh, to talk a little bit about, about that. You'll find more information, too, on these. There's a book uh, that I found really helpful, uh, Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. In this book, you get all four views um, from sort of the big spokespeople of, of the different things, and they respond to each other. Uh, most of it's nice. They are, they are all Christian, so they try to be, but sometimes, you know, it gets a little ugly. So uh, really, there's four different views. There's young earth creationists, progressive creation, intelligent design, and evolutionary uh, creation. And even within these camps, they don't necessarily agree on everything. But this is kind of, when you put it together, this is the most consensus out of those four views. So the first one is young earth creationists, which um, interpret the Genesis story as the mo in the most literal sense. They, uh, they look at sort of the Hebrew uh, yom, which is a, a Hebrew word for day, understood, and they understand it as a 24-hour uh, period, meaning that all of creation took, with, took place within six literal days. When looking at scripture, um, you might find uh, they would turn to Genesis 1, 5. God named the day, God named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning the first day. God named the light day, yeah, all that stuff. So it does it over and over, over and over again. There was evening and morning the third day. So they take a literal approach to this Hebrew word. The next um, group would be the progressive <clears throat> creation uh, or looking at it from an old earth perspective. They would look at uh, the Hebrew yom as age, not necessarily a 24-hour uh, period. Um, it can be, the thing about Hebrew is one word, there's about 5,000 words in Hebrew, and there's way more in, in English. And so one word can be translated into multiple uh, different ways. What you have to, 
what these scholars that have translated have to do is they have to look at the context of the sentences to make sense of why why you translate it um, uh, this way. So, so the word yom can be translated as day, age, time, or or year. It can be really kind of a tedious process to figure out which one, you know, sort of a game of, like it's a sort of a game show, you know, sometimes. They would, they might turn to Genesis uh, 14, or 114, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. It will mark events, sacred seasons, days, and years. They would also talk about, you know, when it comes to sort of scientific understanding based on the speed of light, it's estimated that uh, some visible stars have taken millions of years for light to travel to us. And for them, it couldn't be literal because it takes much longer um, for light to arrive. They would also uh, probably highlight, and this is not on your list, but feel free to add it, um, 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day with is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So it's more disconnecting the understanding of Genesis from our limited perspective and seeing it from sort of, you know, God's perspective. The commonalities between uh, the, the two, the young and the old earth commonalities, uh, they would argue that the book of Genesis is actual history, not allegory or, or poetry. And they would also argue that the order of creation listed in Genesis is accurate the way that it is. Now moving on to intelligent design. Um, intelligent design uh, doesn't really have a position on uh, creation as, as history. They're not so much focused on, on that, uh, but they focus more on the scientific discovery for the interpretation of, of, God's, of God's creation work. They would, you know, some scholars refer to uh, nature creation as sort of the second book of, of the Bible, if you want to think about it that way, in terms of they look at just the beauty of creation and, and the scientific um, design. They, they would agree with uh, the old earth position that uh, the earth is uh, much, much older than scripture seems to suggest, depending on how you read it. Um, but they would disagree with, uh, with both of those first two camps with uh, the creation order in Genesis. Uh, they argue that it doesn't have to follow uh, days or in order that way. But again, you know, each of these people, they're asking, what's the why behind uh, Genesis? Uh, how does the author want to be understood? And they would argue that God spoke and there was a big bang. You know, sort of let there be light. What that must, must have been like. And... Um, if any one of God's scientific processes were slightly altered, we'd all die. So they focus a lot on uh, fine tuning, um, and any other creation views would would agree with this uh, idea that everything is uh, perfectly tuned. That it may not be perfect, you know. There's, um, but each of these views also, when it comes to those imperfections, would turn to our understanding of the fall and somewhere along the way. Something happened that degraded our relationship with God. This is not on your list, but feel free to add it. Uh, Romans 1.20, they might turn to this. Uh, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So they look at the beauty. Um, of this and, and say, you know, how, how can we not believe that there's a God? And then lastly, evolutionary creation. So they would argue too, God spoke and, and uh, there, was a, there was a big bang. There, there was a, 
suddenly a plethora of life brought into the universe. They would argue that God used the evolutionary process to bring forth um, creation. It was a means that God uh, created. And then uh, they would argue that Genesis is partially allegorical, meaning it's not necessarily a literal Adam and Eve as a part of uh, a part of humanity. Um, and actually, if you look at Adam and Eve in Hebrew, it's the it's the Hebrew word for man and, and woman. And so the names that we've given them have kind of something that we've given them from our translation uh, to English. But they don't they don't necessarily believe that um, that all of creation started with with one sort of a, a cluster of of a community that you know, how all of that panned out, you know, that's I wasn't there. Um, old earth uh, position and disagreement with the creation order in, in Genesis, a similar argument to intelligent uh, design, sort of the idea that the earth is, is old. And uh, a few scriptures that uh, they might look at, and I have them. I have them here. Um, Romans five, First Corinthians fifteen. Each of these writers, when they talk about, but death ruled from Adam until Moses, even over those who didn't sin in the same way Adam did. Adam was a type of the one who was coming. In the same way that everyone dies in Adam, so everyone will be given life in Christ. So it is also written, the first human, Adam, became a living person, and the last, Adam, became a spirit that gives life. Uh, when other views argue that scripture that talks about sin originating, originating from Adam, they would argue that it's from an allegorical standpoint and not a literal view. Uh, Luke's genealogy dates all the way back to Adam. Paul indicates that sin comes directly from Adam. Jesus states that history brings us back to these, this one man and woman. Um, but, you know, even just with like sort of the Jewish understanding of the Reconstructionist uh, Jew, uh, there were there were a lot of camps in the Jewish community on ways to interpret these, these passages. And they have lots of really interesting commentaries on what do we do with our understanding of, of Adam and Eve and some of the, uh, some of the Jewish communities that I met, they're they're not so much worried when I ask them this kind of question. They're not so much worried about whether Adam and Eve were literal people. You know, I think sometimes we can kind of get fixated on this, but at least in some of the communities, it's not so much about that. It's more about what does it all mean? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the word, and without the word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not extinguish the light. So what I want to take a few moments to do is I want you to just place a check mark next to the points that you agree with, looking back at those, um, and maybe consider why you disagree with uh, with the other with, with the other things. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. All right, so let's uh let's talk a minute for um let's think about some question a question that we might ask of each group. 
what's a question that you might ask of uh, of each of these of each of these groups? What's a question that you might ask of each of these groups? I would ask the younger nation group, how do you reconcile your beliefs with like carbon dating? Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. That's a good question. It's true. I would probably be with the, with the progressive. Um, you know, we've got two different creation scripts. Which which one's accurate? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got yeah. I mean, there's there's two different creation scripts. Yeah. Plus, throughout history, you've got different cultures have some of the same stories. So, how do you reconcile those with the Bible? Sure. And what's a question that we might ask of uh, the other two: intelligent design and evolution? Evolutionary creation. The evolutionary question some of the probability. Yeah. Because it would be like going from having a high school to an IQ. Yeah. But yeah. to have more than one organism makes any beliefs that have been traveling to make mm -hmm. some it, it's the likelihood of multiples happening at the same time and then yeah. yeah. That's what always felt like Darwinism never really proved the point of the group by being. Yeah. yeah. Have one single cell. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, but why did it start? Yeah. Yeah. How that happen? That's still so like the last. Yeah. Second. And again, that's sort of the. Yeah. And and again, you know, looking back at if if it's if it's explaining how creation happened that's one thing but sort of the why the why it happened you know that's the stuff that it's like were we just an accident you know not find it also go back to, to the time to the time mm -hmm. you know your days your ages your computer time what exactly what we, you don't know what yeah. it actually was but then it goes back to <clears throat> the speed of life all of this transpired, you know, it wouldn't have happened. It's not just like you said, it's not going to be just like boom, it's there. Yeah, it's, it, there's, there's a pro there was a process. How about um, intelligent design? It's the last one we haven't covered. I think it maybe brings up a little bit of why. Uh, I think Austin, you asked this question. You know, why if if it's perfectly tuned, why isn't it perfect? Yeah. So if we look at God as the all-knowing, never makes mistakes, can't, then you almost have to think that it would. It's it is perfect. It's the way design. The way design. Is it is perfect, even though like there might be some things that we view as imperfect. I don't think you made a mistake, mm -hmm. you or she. I don't think that God made a mistake. Right. I would push back a little bit just against that idea, not necessarily. Yeah, no, no, it's it's that fine. idea of how can a childhood cancer be something that is part of a perfect design? I know. It, yeah. Kind of like, and we, we don't have time to solve <laughs> philosophical <laughs> issues. Um, what, what I'm trying to get us to do is, is think more about questions and less about the answers that we. You know, because I, I think again, what we're trying to do with this whole thing is to is to think of is to think from the perspective of the person, the camp that you don't necessarily see eye to eye with. You know, just being able to ask curious questions to to understand, you know, what what they're trying to explain, and also that each of these camps they're all a part of the Christian community. Um, or the human family, so uh, figuring out how do we how do we love each other through that stuff. I totally get what you're saying, um, but that's a whole that's a philosophical debate for. What you're talking about is yeah. It's like what is love? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, gee, can we can we agree what this word means? Yeah, 
depending on your background or your background or my background, the same word, you know, we're totally thinking of different things. Yeah. And, and I think it's important. That's how all this ties together. Everybody's yeah. thinking of something different. And I think that's important too, is again, nobody's nobody's objective. We all look at this and, and we're all asked and we're we all we all it's very tempting for us to on that last statement, you know, it's important to question one's own belief. It's all it's really easy for us to fall into that. Well, we're so sure of ourselves that um, we we don't find ourselves in community with other people who are very different from us. Um, so lots of good, lots of good questions. And I, I purposely do that kind of thing because I think we need to sit in the dissonance of we don't have the answers. We're not, you know, God is the answer, but but he is a, he's a mystery, you know, on terms of what we're, what we are, there's a reason why we're not God. Um, so uh, we'll get into, uh, we'll get into evolutionary creation a little bit more. Um, but what I want to talk, what I want to watch a video of is Noah's flood uh, creating the rock layers. This is a perspective from the young earth a creationist view. And if you don't agree with this view, that's fine. What I would just ask for you to do is to think of some, think of some curious questions or, or even just think of the pros of this argument as, as we watch. Um, so that's, that's one, that's one perspective. And um, I'm not, I'm not telling you, Hey, this is the view to believe what I'm trying to do for each week is to kind of talk about each of these views. And you'll notice too, that I'm going to provide material that kind of goes against each view too. Um, cause I, I, you know, it's one of those, I think we all kind of have a mix of different, um, camps that we're in on some of these. There's an article that I just put out, uh, on your little tables. So you might have to pass that around to people around you. I, I don't expect you to read this. I don't expect you to read this now. Honestly, this is homework for this week. Um, how should we interpret the Genesis flood account? This is from the evolutionary creation perspective. Um, this was an article that, that I, I found uh, sort of the opposite view um, of this, looking at the looking at the flood more. Now, in in historical documents, there is evidence for a flood, but the problem is um, the world wasn't global at the time when the flood happened. And so, you know, so there's some pieces, there's some pieces missing there um, on, on some of this. So they give some description of that. This was the nicest article I could find. Um, if you go outside of, if you go outside of Christianity, the thing about it is what I've noticed about other Christians, at least within these camps is they, they try to be nice. But if you, if you like Google, um, you know, arguments against pre, uh, young earth creationism, you know, it can be really, uh, it's more care, it's more against their character than it is about the views and stuff. And so um, that's where I'm like, okay, now we're not even, now we're not even, uh, we can't even have a conversation, you know? And so, um, which is sort of the American way today, right? But, um, so, uh, so yeah, you'll, you'll want to take a look at, at this article. Um, and what I would ask you to do as you as you do as you do this as you read through this and you do the homework this week is as you look through this does does this change your why for scripture or is your why still solid i think sometimes when we have um so much in our in our why of why we read scripture it can be really um it can be really painful when we read something that's different from what we believe um and not necessarily an eye-opening experience where we learn from each other because we're so we're, we're sort of that you know we're so sure of ourselves that we can't even open ourselves to the possibilities um i do want to know why didn't they rescue the dinosaurs you know i mean you know yeah. the huh. yes i will email you the article I'll send it to you this week. Um, 
Now, you know, despite the fact that the scientific consensus outside of the young earth creation view doesn't agree, um, I will say one of the things that and each of these views do, do but they, they take scripture seriously, you know, in terms of they're trying to figure out what does this all mean? Um, but uh, science continues to reveal incredible uh, proofs of God's creation. And we never forget that scientific interpretation and interpretation of scripture has changed immensely uh, in the past several centuries. Does that make science wrong? No. But saying that misses the point of science because um, science is continually um, discovering. And I think as Christians, sometimes we could use a little bit of that, a little bit of that wisdom. Uh, up until the 20th century, most scientists believed that the universe never had a, be had a beginning. So it would be a bit naive to think that we've discovered everything. One example that I, I found was the London uh, a hammer discovery that uh, in London, Texas, that was discovered in the 1900s. Um, and they, when they first found it, they thought it was millions of years uh, old, which was very uh, confusing. But it turns out that it was uh, it was encased by a rock in a ge geological process that was not known to the original discoverer. But we have to have the humility, though, to admit when we're wrong. Um, and I think one of the one of the conclusions, too, was that aliens must have dropped it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so don't stop reading at Genesis. Um, but again, we kind of have to we kind of have to get into you know the why of of Scripture and why we you know why we want to kind of reconcile the two. So, with that in mind, Andy, you got a you got a few thoughts. You know, I I grew up on a farm. Um, and, you know, being the oldest, uh, and like my mom says, my dad had to take three dogs before he got a boy, so, you know, we were always working for him. Um, but then also grew up in the church. Um, you know, I, growing up, I really never questioned it, any of it. I just, you know, always seen creation and, you know, uh, knew that it had to have been, you know, God's creation that, you know, there had to have been something that created it. And then when I went on to college and I was a uh, I was actually a biology pre-med major. Um, and actually, you know, the more I dove into the science, the more, you know, more questions I would have. But then as I really started looking into it, and especially as I've become a teacher and, you know, really looked into it and really got to thinking and, you know, as I had students question this and had to help students kind of sometimes work, work their way through it. You know, it's like that explains some things. Um, like just understanding DNA and, you know, the creation and, you know, kids will be like, oh, so we're going to learn it came from monkeys. And you're like, no, not that we came from monkeys. It's just that there's been slow processes over the periods of time and it's safe in those traits. You know, the most favorable traits that fit with the environment that survived and reduced. The others didn't even get a chance to reproduce. Um, one thing, you know, and of course, it's kind of one of those camps we've looked at is, you know, like the where did Adam and Eve come from? You know, like the first cell, because we know the cell theory, um, every cell came from a cell, pre existing cell. So, where did that first cell come from? Um, and so that's one process I, or one, you know, concept I still think about, but when we really look like at the DNA and the RNA, um, can we look at the, you know, our understanding of that? And of course, we feel like we feel pretty confident in our understanding of DNA, not to, not to, you know, say that 50 years from now, we don't, you know, discover something a little bit that we've got a little bit off. Um, but even thinking about, like, say, the periodic table, and I know Rick would know this, being a former science teacher himself, um, but, and I don't know how many of you guys took high school chemistry and learned, like, the trends on the table and, um, 
you know, the, what our thought on just the way atoms worked, behaved, and were made up prior to about 1934. And then the amount of science we understood then between 34 and 42, the starting of the Manhattan Project, and the amount of that science, basically that quantum model theory, um, that's now known as the new atomic model, you know, that we basically took advantage of to develop those atomic bombs. And then those here, and then the, when you look at the periodic table and it's arranged by just increasing atomic number, the, the amount of theory, uh, not theories, trends that you see, how it perfectly fits together. It's like, how can you look at our understanding of DNA and our, under, our, our current understanding of chemistry and physics and not believe in a higher being? That there had to be something out there that we cannot explain. And to me, you know, as a physics teacher, there's like, you know, there's a popular thought out there that's like, we, we can't prove it, gravity. Can't prove gravity because science, you know, you have to be able to observe it. You have to be able to uh, have hypotheses. You have to be able to test it. We can't do any of that with gravity. We can't explain anything else. But we can't do any of that with gravity. And so, you know, to me, there's just some of those things that we may not, yeah, ever know. Just one of those mysteries and, you know, and one of those deals that, you know, God will reveal to us what he wants in his own time if he wants to reveal it to us. But that's, you know, there's some of that stuff, like I said, as I delve more in my understanding of science, the more... Yeah, the more it, it explains, uh, create uh, basically nature to me. Um, and when you look at all, when you understand DNA and RNA and mitosis and meiosis, basically mitosis being how your body cells divide, and meiosis basically how your sperm and egg cells are made, and how more of us were born with defects, you know, that any of us were ever more normal. And able to function this long, as long as we have normal, you know, without developing any major issues, it's like there's got to be, yeah, it's a miracle in itself that any of us were ever more normal. You know, that, you know, when you think about all of us as humans have 46 chromosomes, or most of us do, but then there are maybe like those with DNA, and not DNA, those with Down syndrome born with. That third set or that third chromosome 21. Um, there's some others down where they ended up with that third chromosome on another pair. You know, it's like there's got to be, you know, there's got to be something. It's a miracle in and of itself, but what's causing that miracle? Well, God's causing that. But any of us were ever more normal. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Everybody together. <laughs> appreciate you sharing and i'm sure andy love to stick around and answer any questions that you all have and rick as well we're going to hear from a little bit from rick next week so um but to close i want to return to the why of scripture this is john wesley's uh, why the founder of uh, methodism um holy scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation so that whatsoever is not read therein nor may be proved thereby is not required of any man that it should be believed as an article of faith or thought or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. Obviously, he's from a different culture, so there's lots of, you know, those kinds of words. But the idea is uh, his focus is on the, the why of Scripture that everything that we need um, for our salvation can be found in Scripture, uh, not so much caught up in the, the how uh, of things. So um, one of the homework assignments is to look at that article. And then also there was a video. The article was in addition because I was trying to find something specifically addressing the video we watched. Um, but you'll find a, a video uh, on there um, to watch uh, on your homework on that last page of that session. Watch top 10 biblical problems for young earth creationism. Um, my recommendation is just type that into YouTube and jot, jot down some jot down some notes there. Um, and then a little bit of wisdom from the internet. 
I hear you're writing a book on theology. I hope you have a good title. I have the perfect title. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? <laughs> and gravity. <laughs> All right, let's pray. <clears throat> God, help us today and in the days to come, set everything aside that we think we know, everything that I think I know about myself, about others, the assumptions that I bring, so that I might have an open mind to the new creation that you are working out within us. Help us that we might see the truth, that it's more about living righteous, living holy, than it is about being right, that we might come as your son came into the world, asking questions that revealed something more, set apart to show others the way. Amen. All right. See you next week. Thanks for joining us, Ray and Amber. I'll send you the links. That's it.